All right, welcome to the next session at Big Talk from Small Libraries 2017, Digitize It Yourself, a method of in-house digitization. Um, Amanda Shep is on the line with us from Lilydale, New York, um, my home state. I'm originally from New York. Um, not near that, not near Buffalo, about five hours away is where I'm from, <laughs> but upstate New York nonetheless. And um, Mehdi sent in this, this presentation, uh, this proposal about doing your own, I thought it was really great for small libraries. Digitization is a huge thing going on in lots of libraries. We have a program here in Nebraska for libraries to do it. It can be intimidating, and how do you do it? And I think this is going to be a great session to see you can figure out exactly how you can actually do this yourself. So I will hand over to you to take it away. All right. Hello. Um, so a little bit about my library. Uh, I am a rare books and special collections facility in a spiritualist community. Uh, it's a very historic place. Uh, it began in 1875. The library was originated in 1886, so it's a really old collection that I'm working with for the most part. Uh, not a lot of new acquisitions, so um, my primary focus since I started in 2014 has been uh, digitizing our more fragile and delicate materials. Um, this uh, process is something I've developed at my last few jobs. Uh, and it, I find that it really works for me uh, because of the types of materials that I work with. Um, lot, lots of newspapers, lots of books, you get the random 3D object here and there um, because it is a, a historic like vacation destination. There are old souvenirs from the town that we have in our collections that I'm in the process of digitizing, uh, old music books. Uh, so there's a pretty healthy variety of stuff. Um, so, uh, essentially, um, this process has kind of um, been carrying me through uh, in my digitizations. I'm currently using it for two separate projects. Uh, one uh, is digitizing issues of a newspaper that was published in Lilydale uh, to kind of get that out there because it's not really available online. Um, and I am also uh, digitizing uh, spiritualist music books. Uh, if they're very interesting and unique. Um, so, uh, uh, as I've sort of touched upon, uh, why do it yourself? Uh, a lot of institutions don't really have the funds set aside, especially if they're rural and small, for a massive digitization thing. Uh, sending a lot of your materials to vendors can get quite expensive depending on how much stuff you have to digitize. Uh, if it's fragile, it can be sort of a risk to send it. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of a control freak, so I like having things in my own situation, and I like being able to take part in the process because I feel it gets me to understand the materials and the content of the collection a lot better. Uh, so it's, it's something I've really enjoyed doing as a process. I don't find it to be a very uh, technically difficult kind of thing, and I find it to be an approachable science. Uh, for our newspaper project, we worked with a local college and got an intern. Uh, so uh, she's a photography major, and she's been working with me along on this project, and some of her work is in this presentation as well. Uh, so advantages to using the, the black box or chamber method. It's basically a portable photography studio. Uh, you get a lot of better focus with your camera on the object being photographed because it sort of separates it from the background. Um, you have a lot more improved control over your photographic lighting. Uh, the, the box itself is uh, black. Uh, it's made out of foam core board. Uh, and it's lightweight, so you can put a lot of... Uh, you can unfold like newspapers inside of it. It's spacious enough to accommodate a lot, a variety of materials. Um, and because of the texture of the paper uh, that the foam core board is made out of, it basically acts like a funnel for light. Uh, light sources above or natural light sources, or if you have tabletop lights that you're using, uh, it basically sucks up all of the available light and leaves your item that you're digitizing to sort of pop out against that background. Uh, it also adds to the consistency of background in your shots and it makes the editing process of these a lot easier. 
Uh, it's easy to use. Uh, I mentioned I have intern, uh, interns that I've trained, uh, student workers. You can kind of apply this to them if you have uh, those in your library or if you have a library assistant or an, even an active volunteer. Um, it's, it's a very open-ended thing. Uh, like I said, you can use it with two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. Uh, if you have a maker space, you can also use it as a sort of set box for stop motion animation and things like that. I've seen people use uh, theirs in their library in a variety of ways in addition to the digitization aspect of it. Um, so you can use this in your library uh, or in museums. I have used these for, uh, for making virtual tours and uh, like a visual catalog. Uh, you can use them for small runs of in-house collections if you have, say, a collection of 30 items that needs to be digitized. Uh, sometimes a vendor's price will be a little bit striking for 30 objects, uh, depending on what those objects are and how far you have to send them and how much money you have allocated for stuff like this. And it's, I find in my experience it's a bit easier to just do it uh, yourself uh, in-house. Uh, you can also test uh, larger scale projects, digitize a few items with it and see how you enjoy the output of it and see how it looks for you. Uh, and then you can sort of take that to your board of directors or take that to your administrators and see if they think that this is worth digitizing and what it would look like or uh, even to display the urgency of digitizing something. Uh, you can also use this to create sample images to apply for grants and funding for larger scale digitization projects. Uh, and I have used it at home for a few image capturing things for like eBay sales, uh, things like that. Uh, so now that we know about this delightful thing and how to use it in theory, uh, let's see how we construct one. So as I mentioned, you will need foam core board. Uh, I used the 30 inch by 20 inch. Uh, you need four sheets. Uh, I use my trusty hot glue gun. Uh, I find that you can build one of these on around four cylinders of glue. Uh, little tiny plastic clamps uh, are very lightweight. They don't puncture your board. I find if you use the, the smaller metal ones, they do tend to puncture the corners of the board. Uh, but if you don't mind, eh, that's okay. Uh, right angle brackets, like the kind you would build a shelf with. All of this, all of these materials are things you can find at a Michaels or at a hardware store. So it's not like these are exotic items that you have to get from far away. Um, a straight edge like a yardstick works perfectly and an X-Acto knife, box cutter, sharp scissors, uh, one of something like that. Uh, so step one, you take your two, two of the four boards, uh, you glue them together at a 90 degree angle. Uh, it's important that you work quickly because uh, hot glue dries really, really, really fast, uh, as, as the crafting ones among us know. Uh, it's easier to do this with two people because you can work at a much faster rate to assemble it successfully without having the, oh no, I have to take it apart and do it again problem. <laughs> um, so once that is no longer hot and stringy, you take your brackets, you clamp it in place, uh, and then you sort of fill that seam with glue to make it uh, reinforced. You can leave it like this for a while to let it dry, uh, reinforce it even further if you need to. Uh, what you're basically doing is trying to fill in the crack between the two boards so that light can't filter in through it behind the box uh, because this can affect how you capture the items in it. So you're basically making a, uh, a light seal for it. Uh, so once you have your, your back and base, uh, we're going to make the sides. You take one board, glue it to the other two boards along a side, um, and then you repeat this sort of process where you, once you have it in place, you put the clamps on, you put the brackets on, and then you reinforce it, fill in any small cracks, uh, make sure that the boards are tight together, uh, and then you repeat this with the fourth side. Uh, so you should end up with something that looks like this. Um, I've, I have used it like this with just the edges hanging off in the past. 
Uh, but I have found that sometimes this can create shadows depending on what other sorts of light you have in the room. Uh, like towards the front of your object, if you're using tabletop lights, it can make a weird light effect. Uh, so I found it's easier to cut them off. Uh, so you basically score your edges with your uh, box cutter or razor blade, exacto knife, etc., and yardstick, um, and then you put it against the edge of the table and just snap it right off. Uh, you do this with both sides of it, and then you can kind of clean up your edges if you need. Uh, so yes, this is detailing the snapping off process. You can do it relatively neatly, um, but you want to keep the brackets and clamps on during this process because I have found uh, the, the extra reinforcement for them is, is a little bit more advisable. Um, but when you're ended up, uh, when you are finished with this, you'll have these nice neat square edges. So hooray, it's built. So let's find out uh, how we go through and use this. Uh, this is what my space looks like in my library. Uh, I've had a lot more questions in the past on the technical aspect of the, the rest of the process, um, so I'm going to get into that more right here. Uh, any questions, uh, feel free to pop them up whenever if you need. Uh, so this is my space. This is a bound uh, journal. Uh, it is a standard like broadsheet newspaper size. And it fits comfortably in here. Uh, as you can see, there's not a lot of excessive shadows or anything, and most of the light is focused on the object itself naturally. Uh, inside of that book, this is what the raw image looks like. Uh, I prefer to capture two pages at a time if I can, if the binding allows me to. Um, but as you can see, it's just a very raw image, but mostly it's it's flat, it's centered, um, and it's it's clear to read. If you uh, zoom in on it, on it, you can see even the very small newsprint, which is uh, difficult from a lot of newspapers of this era uh, due to the very small font that they're pressed in. Uh, so after you capture your raw image, um, it depends on how you would like to display your collection. Uh, some, some display methods, people just use PDFs and make them into like a searchable text document through an optical character recognition process. You use specialized software um, and the program reads the text. Uh, it gives you an output that mirrors the text in this document with the uh, text that is on your PDF that is actually in the newspaper. Uh, you basically go through and check it and make sure that everything lines up correctly and then you have a searchable PDF from this. Um, so in order to make a searchable PDF you make your editable images from your master TIFF files. Uh, you organize your files in whatever naming convention and system you need to. Uh, you upload your images into a PDF creation program, like if you have an Adobe Acrobat suite, uh, or if you are making uh, PDFs from like a, a software editor, or not a software editor, um, <laughs> a photo editing software, um, or ABBYY is an, an optical character recognition software that I'm currently using. It is uh, basically the top of the line. It has the highest recognition rate between the native text in your PDF image and the output of the text that it recognizes. Um, so I, I would recommend ABBYY. There are some other optical character recognition programs out there. Um, they even come on your phone if you have a smartphone. Uh, there is one called Cam Scanner. It's a very nice app-based program. Uh, that takes very quick PDFs and it also has a pretty decent OCR rate. Um, so anyway, after you have your PDFs, uh, you stitch your images together or you keep them in individual pages, whatever your display method requires. Uh, you can OCR them if necessary and then you can display it proudly. 
uh, if you are not doing text-based things or if you would not prefer to have your text searchable and you just want it in a easily viewable format, uh, which is a little less work and a little bit more digestible sometimes. Uh, it basically depends on your, your patron base and how they're going to use it. Um, so you, you would make the same TIFF files from your master, your raw data and your master images. Um, you organize them in their preferred system, uh, whatever naming conventions you need, and then you edit the images using a, a Photoshop or a, the free version of Photoshop. Um, uh, and there's an open source program which is basically like a free version of Photoshop called GIMP, a uh, new image manipulation program. Uh, I like it. It has a lot of the same characteristics, a lot of the same tools. Um, there's a few slight differences, but overall I find that it, it gets the job done. Um, uh, then after that, you preserve your images in whatever format you would like and display your collection proudly. Uh, so to kind of visualize this conversion process, because I know that's a, a lot of words I just spat at you. Um, you, you take uh, the raw data from your camera. Uh, when you take a, an image of an item in the box uh, with a digital SLR camera, like um, we use a, a Canon, uh, you end up with a raw data file if you are not taking it in a JPEG or something like that. Uh, the whole point of digitization is to preserve as much information in the images as possible. Uh, so you're really trying to get uh, the largest amount of stuff in a single take that you can. Uh, it's going to give you clearer text, it's going to make the processing a lot easier, uh, it's going to give you a lot more to work with. Um, like, like with a lot of practices and crafts, it's easier to subtract than it is to add. Uh, so the, you start with a bulkier image and then you sort of take away from it and pare it down into its, its final form. Um, Size-wise, you're talking about uh, an image file that's about 40 megs uh, to an image file that's about 6 megs. Uh, so it's going to play a role in how you store these projects as well. Um, so this is from our current uh, project, the Sunflower newspaper. Uh, these are images from my intern, Brittany Ford. Um, so this is the image that she starts with. It's it's the bare bones um, image of the newspaper. Uh, it's going to be at a high DPI rate, uh, which is going to be the, the amount of pixels that fit in your picture. Uh, so the higher your DPI saturation, the more information will fit in your picture. Uh, she's been taking these at 600. Uh, most common displays want them at about 300, so that, that also gives you an idea of, uh, that you're downscaling. Uh, so, you take your image, this is what you get, um, the, uh, and I will walk you through the process of how you get your, um, your TIFF out of it. So if she's using a Mac, uh, this is Lightroom, but it would be the same in any, uh, in Adobe or any other sort of PDF creator program. So she's adjusting her edges. Uh, first she changes it to black and white because it makes the, um, the rest of the process easier. Uh, you can change it back from black and white, but it, it also depends on how you are going to display it, whether or not you're going to OCR it, uh, what you're, you're going to do uh, with the final product, basically. Uh, so she's black, uh, it's black and white, and now she's going to crop it and take the edges down so we can just focus on the text uh, because that's going to be the final focus of our project. Uh, once, once the edges are aligned uh, and the, the text is straight, there's no, it, there's no tilt to it, there's no kerning or keystoning or anything, um, she can crop down the edges so that you have just this bare text at the bottom. And then from this point, you have basically what you're going to work with in the final product. Uh, so she's going to export it to PDF.
or export it to TIFF uh, so that you have this. Uh, this is going to be your, your master image that you're making the PDFs from. So this is uh, a simplified version of the raw data that you start with. And then this is your final your final image that you will start the second part of the process with. Uh, so as you can see, uh, it's a little bit crisper to read. The text is jumping out from the page a little bit more. Uh, keep in mind this newspaper is from 1905, so it's uh, thinning in the paper. The, the text is so dark in some instances that you can see the reverse side of the page through the page you're looking at. Uh, and that does uh, play a role in how you process the images, uh, especially if it's acidified paper and it's getting to a point in its age where uh, the the ink is starting to see through on every in every in places that you shouldn't see it, basically. Uh, so I'd like to show you some examples uh, of collections that I've digitized with this method. Uh, first is the Nickel Snake Oil collection. Uh, this is a uh, collection of um, patent medicines that are basically sold in those old medicine wagon shows and uh, fake mail order remedies and fun things like that. Um, it's held at the Center for Inquiry Libraries in Buffalo and it's currently up on New York Heritage. Do -do. Hi, my little is there a lot of people out there now? A lot of kids. Maybe I've heard Is it 2.30 now? It's getting there. Okay. Uh, can everybody see this? Uh, yep, it's coming through nice. Delightful. Uh, so this is a patent remedy for Thomas, uh, Dr. Thomas's eclectic oil. Um, it was digitized in the black box. Oh. Sorry. Um, we used a, a lined paper behind it. Uh, the texture of the gray paper uh, was basically chose to focus the, the light uh, for the camera preservation process. Uh, because it is a, a medicine collection, you're dealing with a lot of glass bottles. Um, so they are an item that's difficult to capture because they do reflect the light. Uh, so it's important if you're using a reflective object to have something behind it uh, in the background that can absorb the light and sort of um, diffuse that effect, basically. Uh, next, the Skeptizium uh, is also in the Center for Inquiry in Buffalo, New York. Uh, they have uh, a senior research fellow that has a massive collection of uh, skeptically oriented items and he was in the process of creating a digital museum. Uh, we used the Omeka platform which is a digital display uh, software. Uh, we're considering restructuring it because uh, the user interface isn't exactly what we wanted. Um, he wanted something more like an actual museum that you walk through. Uh, so I'm also considering a virtual reality display for him. Uh, so this is an item from the Skeptizium. Uh, this is a shrunken head. Uh, as you can see, it's also very, very textured, uh, but to preserve the museum aesthetic, it was done against black velvet. Uh, so you have a variety of textures here which plays an interesting role in the photography process. Uh, the hair is is going to absorb a lot of the light, the wood is going to reflect a lot of the light, and the skin itself is very papery and thin. Uh, so it's it's another thing that sort of mutes it. Uh, it was a somewhat difficult item to photograph, but uh, the, the, I think the capture process was pretty worth it. <laughs> um, next, uh, the Robert Green Ingersoll Birthplace Museum is a small institution in Dresden, New York. Uh, they have a virtual tour. Uh, this was an item that was very interesting. It is a spoon with Robert Ingersoll's head on it. I thought it was very interesting and neat. Uh, also difficult because of the, it's, it's a silver spoon, so it's incredibly reflective. Um, another tenuous item to capture, but 
the importance is the, the paper and the textures that you use in the background. Um, finally, uh, finally, I'd like to show you another newspaper that I have digitized. Uh, this is in the database of the International Association for the Preservation of Spiritualist and Occult Periodicals. <laughs> Uh, they are a fun group. They're a bunch of researchers uh, that uh, works in spiritualism uh, to research the uh, edgier parts of the history gap, basically. Uh, so this is one of their final PDF products. Uh, and as you can see, it is searchable. If you type an event, it takes you to any word that is done. Uh, anything that contains that word, and this is uh, done with the optical character, uh, optical character recognition software, ABBYY. Uh, it gives you a nice, clean document to work with in the end. Uh, so that is uh, it's why it's my choice. Uh, currently, I mentioned I'm working um, on digitizing music books and the wrapping up the Sunflower Project. Uh, my next project is going to be digitizing precipitated spirit paintings. Uh, that will be interesting because most of them are uh, large. Uh, a lot of these are life-size portraits of people. Uh, so uh, it, it's going to be a fun challenge. <laughs> um, as I sort of mentioned before, uh, once you have this ability to digitize um, and this little space to do it in, uh, you might want to get some supplements. They're not in all necessary. Uh, with certain objects, I found that tabletop lights do help. Uh, they are about 60 bucks for a decent pair of them on Amazon. Uh, you can get little tabletop sized ones. Uh, I have little LEDs that have barn doors and different little plates that you can stick in front of them to change the tone and color of the light and if you want to get fancy with it you can totally get fancy with it. Um, you also need a digital camera that's capable of taking uh, TIFF quality raw images. Again you want a 600 or over DPI uh, for your initial capture process and then you can pare it down from there to make it usable. Um, you will also need photo processing or editing software uh, like GIMP or Photoshop or ABBYY or Lightroom, um, depending on what you're using this collection for and how you want the public to use it. Uh, optional cat not included. Uh, I have found uh, today that this also makes an excellent cat trap. <laughs> so if any of you have uh, cats that need a tiny clubhouse, that, that is another <laughs> use apparently. Multi-use, yes, good idea. <laughs> And I hope that I have inspired you to go forth and digitize. <laughs> uh, or catch anybody... my Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, so if anybody has any questions, I know I'm ending uh, a little bit early, but I, I usually get more process in the questions than anything. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, we do have a, bunch, a few questions that have come in. If anybody does have questions, uh, use the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I can see those questions coming in and I will uh, share them with um, Amanda here so she can answer you. Um, let's just start at the first one we got here. Um, how do you deal with copyright? Or are you only digitizing pre-1923 items? Uh, because of the age of my collection, the majority of these are pre-1923, uh, but they are also the ones that are in the most need of assistance. Uh, my library originated in a tent, uh, so a lot of the books are have been exposed to the elements along the way. Um, we're on a lake, on a beach, so there's, there's quite a bit of uh, that going on. Um, and the building was also recently heated about seven years ago. Before that, it, it has no conditioning. Uh, so the collection is exposed to some extreme conditions in the weather. Mm. Um, so that's, that's mostly uh, my issues with it. Uh, other than that, I haven't really come into a lot of copyright uh, finangos because the, the people having me digitize their items were the owners of those items or mm -hmm. it wasn't really a copyright thing. Um, 
but that's that's basically all my experience with it. Right. Well, you're you're doing a lot of really historical stuff, obviously. Yeah. So it's kind yeah. of almost a moot point for what you're doing. I was going to ask you about your building. You'd said how old the library itself was. Um, and I was going to ask about the building. Is the building that old? Um, well, how old is where you were actually in? And now you just said you were originally in a tent. Yeah. Uh, in <laughs> Uh, our founder, Marion Skidmore, uh, started a tent outside of her house that was the tent library for the town. Oh, okay. uh, Lilydale started as a summer camp, uh, religious camp town, uh, so a lot of people live in cottages. Uh, uh, now uh, they lived in tent houses previously, like their little structures made of just big canvas flaps. So it was seasonal. Of, it was only seasonal, yeah. right, not year-round. Yeah, uh, it it reflects that in our patronages now. Uh, we're still a, a very much a summer like tourist attraction kind of thing, uh, or a vacation destination. Mm -hmm. uh, so summer, I get a lot of uh, people coming in and out. We have a historical documentary that we show in the mornings uh, about Lilydale. Uh, we do lectures. All my programming is only for nine weeks in July and August, and that's about all I get. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, it's just me and myself and my digitization projects. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, next question we have, um, and actually you're, a few slides ago would explain answer this question potentially. Um, could you use your cell phone to capture the images? Oh yes, okay. uh, depending on the level of camera that you have, uh, some modern cell phones are like, especially the newer iPhones, the Google phones. Uh, Motorola has a uh, phone out that has a full camera on the back uh, that also has a pretty good megapixel count. Uh, but if you have something over 9 megapixels or so, you can probably use it to make a very successful uh, PDF or digitized image. Uh, again, it all depends on what you're using it for. Uh, if you're using it for like a state-funded project, sometimes they have more strict requirements and parameters. Uh, but if it's for your own in-house thing and you just want it for your own storage or your own use, yeah, if it works for you, sure. Now, it would have to be up to a certain um, level in order for the um, any of the OCR yeah. software to, to capture it, though, if that's the route you're going. You yeah. Need it if to it's be searchable, you'd need it at a certain level. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in order for you to have the the heavy weighted data filled image to pare down into the the final thin nice pretty image <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh, go ahead try and see what happens <laughs> oh yeah um, okay um, if when you're doing a book like you had in your first example the book opened up um, if the book spine doesn't allow the pages to lie flat do you have decurling software or do you use a special stand how do you deal with a book that won't open up nice and flat like that one in your example um, with some of my more problematic pieces uh, I have a an acrylic book cradle um, like one of those display things that has it open at a certain angle uh, so that you can kind of read it and then I will just hold down the edges with book snakes. To do the best that you can get in there, yeah. And you can always yeah. just angle the camera to get as good a view, I suppose, too, as good a picture. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the advantage to this uh, over scanning is you're not just smooshing the item. You can kind of digitize and capture the item within the confines of the item itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so if there's something you have to hold a certain way or work with, it, it can make it easier. Um, I've, I've worked with a couple uh, bound volumes that are extra wide, uh, and you can kind of lay only one side flat and have the other side kind of leaning against the edge of the uh, container. But it it's not exactly um, unconducive to capturing the image because at least you have one side flat. Mm -hmm. Again, it it all depends on the particular image or item that you're using too. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually goes to another question that I've got a little farther down here about um, how do you hold the camera there? Do you have it um, mounted on something on a tripod, or are you just how are you uh, doing the camera setup? Because you just you built the script about building the box and everything, but I wasn't we weren't sure about that the camera itself. Uh, you're using. That all sort of depends on the item and also on the photographer. Uh, my intern is uh, a photography student, uh, so she just 
kind of wung it and just freeformed everything and just had the camera in her hands uh, because she was comfortable getting the angle she needed. Uh, mm -hmm. I have done that before, uh, but there are certain items uh, where I have used a tripod um, at a distance away. Uh, there are um, for the Skeptizium, I had some very small items, like there was a clay figurine that was buried with, it, it would be a little thing that you would wrap into a mummy, so it's about an inch and a half tall and it's made of clay, uh, and I had to zoom in ridiculously far on it, and I didn't want to take the image too many times, uh, so I had it on a tripod for level and just zoomed it right in and got the image I needed. Mm -hmm. For something like that, we need to make sure the details of it, especially also like that spoon or something that you want to not be, you need to be very still <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. to make sure that it comes through in those the, those materials that are not just you know, journals or newspapers. Mm -hmm. They need a different uh, a different way of doing it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's the nice part about it is, it, is uh, this way allows you to be a little more flexible and you're not really forcing your items to do a thing that they might not uh, be okay with doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, lighting question. You did mention you know, recommendation for lights to buy, um, to have. Um, do you use diffusion for book lighting? Uh, do you use multiple light sources? And how about for textured and sculpted objects? Basically, what's the lighting situation depending on the item you're for each of the kinds of items you've done? Uh, for books, uh, I have found using natural light for the most part is the best. Uh, it it kind of gives you the, the best quality, um, but that could also be my reading room. I have really bright overhead lights, and that's the only light source in the room. Uh, they're very centralized, and they don't give a lot of shadows or anything. Uh, so I, I have preferred that. Uh, for some of the other things, um, especially reflective items, light can be really hardcore uh, and difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Capturing a, a spirit trumpet, which is basically a very long cone made out of tin, uh, they, they're very, very reflective objects, uh, and capturing them was one of the most difficult things I was doing. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Basically, to, to do it successfully, uh, I used uh, full-scale uh, lights, like like video lights, um, like 12-inch LED lights behind me, uh, and diffusers that were closer to the table to kind of soften the reflections against the light. Um, but because of the extremely low lighting to not reflect on the, the trumpet itself, uh, I ended up basically doing Victorian SLR photography. Uh, it took me almost 90 seconds to fully capture the image. Oh, uh, wow. Mm -hmm. Once I pressed the shutter button. Uh, so it was a really intense process. <laughs> so it looks like a lot of um, experimenting for different different um, items to figure out what, what, what works best in the end. Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, it allows you for a greater experimentation. Uh, to kind of figure out what works for you and what works for your item because there's, uh, especially for interesting libraries with interesting collections, and I know that there's a lot of them out there, uh, even historical societies uh, can have a variety of very cool things. Um, there, there are quite a few around me that have uh, very, very interesting objects uh, in need of digitization and um, we found approachable solutions for a lot of them. Uh, there's a lady around here that has used this for glass lantern slides. Um, oh, okay. By putting one of those drawing desks under it that illuminates the paper. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. By putting the slide on that, uh, because the images were starting to kind of decay and chip away, she wanted to get them and didn't really want to send them out uh, because they are quite fragile. Uh, so we back illuminated it, blocked off the lighting from the table, and just captured the illuminated slide. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, we have here in Nebraska a, a Nebraska Memories Project where we that we host here at the Nebraska Library Commission, um, collecting different um, 
put in different collections from different libraries and historical societies around the state online. Um, but it is just specific to certain things, paper items, uh, newspapers, thing, uh, uh, postcards, photographs are what we have in there. Um, I think it, so. I think this would be very useful for places who have other like physical items that they might want to digitize that aren't being put into some collection they may know about. Something like this that is trying to get all these Nebraska things together. We have certain things we don't. They're just based on what we've decided the content of the this particular thing are going to be. Um, they would not fit into that. This would be great for those places that have other stuff that they want to digitize, um, just that we're not doing. Oh yeah, as part of our program, yeah. Um, so I know we've had there certain things have been offered to us, and we sometimes have to say, well, that's not really the um, in our collection development policy for this project. So try something else. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we have a few more questions. Um, so, what are the if there are any advantages of photographing a book rather than scanning it? Um, or what's the difference? It depends on uh, the fragility of the item. Uh, my items are pretty fragile, and the process of physically taking a book and smushing it into a scanner... Um, not, not a good idea. <laughs> it doesn't really do well with the spines. Um, also, because of the uniqueness of our items, I don't really have the luxury of stripping the book from its, spot, from its cover and feeding it through a sheet scanner. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a, a wonderful problem solver, but then I wouldn't have any books and I would lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but it, it depends on a case-by-case -case situation. Like if it's a book that uh, you have the only copy that you would like to preserve or make available online, uh, if, if, you're, if you have the capability to do that with copyright, um, it's it's useful to kind of do something like this in a way that won't destroy the original item. Uh, and that's something that is, is a tenuous topic in the field of digitization. Some people just know it's all about the information and who cares about the physical object, but mm. uh, there are other people that just know the physical object is fine. Don't, don't hurt it. <laughs> yeah. That, that is important as well, the actual, yeah. Yeah, so, so did come there to actually wants to see the item in hand. Yeah. Oh yeah, like particularly in my institution, uh, people have a lot of emotional attachment to the books in it. Um, it's it's a place where people's families have been going for generations, uh, where someone's mother or grandmother or great aunt had been a librarian, uh, we or had written a book that's in our collections. Uh, we've had. Uh, the, one of the most touching experiences I've ever had was watching a lady um, who came in, her great aunt had written this lovely book of poetry that's got this beautiful gold embossing on the front and it's just this lovely beautiful book and it was signed and she had never seen a physical copy of the book before and she held this book and just wept. Oh. And I couldn't take that experience away from that lady. No, no now you can never, yep. <laughs> wow. See, books are important. Not everything needs to be digital only. Exactly. All right. Um, all right. Oh, oh. Someone does have a tip about um, if you are doing the photographing them, make sure to look up your camera model's lens distortion characteristics. Um, for example, GIMP has an add-on that compensates for distortion. So yes. sometimes see what your camera has, see what these product, these uh, software programs have. Yes, it's a really excellent a point. Picture. Yeah. Yeah, you'd mentioned the one, the um, cam scanner. Um, I have that on my cell phone. I actually use it to take pictures of things like um, recipes and whatnot. And then, like I said, they are searchable, which is really very useful. When yeah, you're recipes I use it for, in so many um, different places. <laughs> yeah, I use it for e-reference a lot. There are certain people that just, I need this page of this book, and that's it. And I can just, oh, make a quick PDF, and there it goes. Mm -hmm, send it off. Awesome. Um, How uh, someone is trying to figure out if they have time to do this kind of thing, um, how long would you say a hundred-page book would take to do, just to to get 
photograph and take care of. Like, um, this is a process that the more you do it, the the faster and better you get at it. Mm -hmm. uh, your first few pages might be a little clunky. Uh, when my intern first started, she was getting about five minutes a page or so because she wanted to adjust everything and make it just right and perfect. And then after her first round of editing, she realized, oh my god, I can fix all of this later. Why am I, doing, right. why am I taking so long? Um, and she got down to about a page a minute. Uh, the group of researcher, researchers from the IAPSOP uh, that had that light newspaper, the searchable PDF that I showed you, mm -hmm. um, they come in uh, every few months and just mass digitize uh, using this method. Um, there are just four guys, they come in, they take off their shoes, they take a stack of books, and then they just go <laughs> and they are in there for like six hours. Wow. So you know, um, it might be the kind of thing you just don't devote like a whole day and say, I'm doing it. And oh, it is their lifeblood. Hang it out. But, wow. but in that six hours, they will go through six or seven bound volumes of newspapers and come out with about 64 gigs a piece of captured data. Nice. Uh, so it's it, it can be a pretty quick and healthy process. Uh, I would say if you're doing a hundred page book and it's not too difficult to to open it to each page and it's it's somewhat simple to get through, you could probably have a finished product in about three weeks safely. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work, like you said, going into the um, editing afterwards to make it usable enough, depending on what you're doing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get into the process, um, okay. I have a couple of I think, que last questions here. Um, you mentioned the Omeka platform for digital display. What other resources can you use to display the images? Um. Oh, geez. <laughs> recommend. Um, <laughs> there, there are a lot of softwares out there. Uh, Archivematica is is one uh, that lets you do. Uh, a lot more in-depth cataloging and organization of your items. Um, there is there's like a I think it's just called the collection or collection software, um, but that is another open source web uh, open source web platform based one. Hmm. Um, a lot of people use like Flickr or things like that to, to host some of their collections. You can use it on a web platform. Uh, you can build a nice beautiful gallery uh, out of like a Squarespace website, um, which is another really easy display method if you just want to create your own website uh, for your digital collections. Uh, that makes it, it's a service that makes it amazingly easy to do so. Um, Okay, and is that what are um, somebody asked about your? Well, you're doing multiple collections. So the ones that you listed there as the examples, um, are those all things that are part of your library, or just uh, the, uh, collections you did for other organizations? Oh, um, or make sure. <laughs> okay, uh, before I forget, uh, there is another major display thing, uh, Content DM. Uh, is That's it a, a is. very mm -hmm. it's yeah. a major display software? Um, it, it depends on your level of patience and amount of metadata, I, I think, for ease of use with that one. Um, and what okay. you have, yeah, because the, the, you had listed a bunch of different collections there, obviously, that you're doing work for some organizations. Um, and someone wants to know, can your items be searched from um, outside those specific organizations? Are they just in-house, or are these all, like, public online where anybody can go and look at them? Uh, most of them, yeah. Uh, the the uh, the Center for Inquiry Collections, the Skepticism, and the um, the Snake Oil Collection. Uh, the Snake Oil Collection is available on New York Heritage, which is a uh, statewide digital consortia of digital collections from local institutions uh, and historical uh, institutions, historical societies, stuff like that. Um, so there's it's uh, physical objects like two and three D objects like postcards, uh, ephemera, things like that. Uh, the sunflower will be up on New York Historic newspapers, 
uh, which is a free database of newspapers published in New York State uh, beginning in 1800s. Um, but the Robert Ingersoll is also a branch of the Center for Inquiry Libraries, um, and they are uh, they're in Dresden, it's a physical museum, but their entire collection is available online, viewable as a web tour. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the IAPS OP database, that's fully available, fully searchable, and they've got an amazing array of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know I saw these, there were links to all these in your presentation slides, too. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, afterwards when we do have this up, you'll be able to get to those links or just you know search them. I'm sure a, a good Google search will come ac across all of where all of these are lo are located online. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we're right at 3:50 p.m. Central Time. Um, anybody have any other last-minute questions? Anything you want to throw out right now while we're still here on? in this section of Big Talk. Oh, did everybody get their questions out? Looks like it. Okay. <laughs> well, you know where to find Amanda. There's her um, email, Twitter account there. Um, she'll be happy, I'm sure, to give you any input and ideas about what um, she's doing. And so oh, yeah. Get your own uh, projects going. I'm also Anyways, on LinkedIn. <laughs> You're on where? I'm also on LinkedIn. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> Thanks again for letting me present. Right. Yeah, thank you. It was very, like I said, very interest, very, very useful, very interesting. I, I was glad to see, like I said at the beginning, when people get into this thinking about digitization, it can be high technology. I need to know. I need to have this huge, you know, piece of equipment, something fancy. I yeah. just can't think about it and. Not always. No, you you can do it yourself. It can be approachable, yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you're the, the step by step was just awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. All right.